Well, good morning again. Are uh, you ready to open your Bibles and do some Bible study this morning? Yes. Okay, let's go to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, chapter 12. And let's read verse 1. Daniel 12, 1. And it says, At, and at that time shall Michael, and who is Michael, by the way? That Jesus. The name Michael appears five times in the Bible. Three times in the Old Testament, only in the book of Daniel three times. And two more times in the New Testament. And every time that you see Michael, you see Satan. Because Michael is a title that is given to Jesus as the commander of the heavenly host. It's the military name of Jesus. And what is the meaning of that word, Michael? One that is like him. And who is that one? That's Jesus, who is like the Father. So here we see Michael. At that time, we just read, Michael, stand up. Let's wait for a moment. What is Michael doing? Standing up. Let me ask you a question. Uh, don't worry, I'm going to give you the answer. But I just want you to think for a moment. Has Michael ever stood before in Bible history? Before this time? One more time. There was another time when Michael was standing up. Where? Let's go to the book of Acts. Chapter 7. Go to the New Testament. Acts. Chapter 7. And there we are going to read verses 55 and 56. And this is what it says. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus doing what? Standing. On the right hand of God. So who's standing once again? Jesus. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man is standing on the right hand of God. When we're talking, what we're talking about this morning is Michael standing up at the end of time. But we just read that once again, or one more time, he stood up in human history. When was that? When Stephen was being stoned. So Jesus, he, I mean, just, just take, have a picture of this. Stephen had a wonderful sermon. I mean, it was so wonderful that the entire sermon is recorded in the Bible. You have few sermons in the Bibles, but this is one of them. And Stephen was telling them, you people, when the Messiah came, you killed him. Of course, they were not happy with him. So they took him out of the city. They gathered stones and they were ready to, to crush him to death. And he was surrounded by death, right? He knew that his time was up. What did he do? He looked up into heaven. And he saw Jesus standing up. So this is an important point. When you and I are surrounded by difficulties, what are we going to see? Are we going to see the difficulties, even death? Or we're going to be looking at Jesus? It's going to make a big difference, friends. But let me tell you, sooner or later, you and I are going to face difficult times. Amen. And the only way to make it through it is by looking at Jesus. See, Stephen did not see death. That was irrelevant to him. He saw Jesus. And now Jesus is standing up. What was the meaning of that in, in prophecy? Are you studying the book of Daniel? Daniel 9. What prophecies do we find there? 70 weeks, right? And was the end of the 70 weeks that, day, that very day? Yes. When Jesus, I mean, when Stephen was killed by the Jewish people that day, that meant that the time of probation for the Jewish nation was over, right? And what was the sign of it? Jesus was standing up. 
No more intersection for the Jewish nation as his chosen people. Now they were going to be saved, but, but as individuals. It was no longer his chosen nation. So when we see in Daniel 12, Michael standing up, what is the meaning of it? That the time of probation is up. Has come to an end. We saw it in the, in the year 34. The killing Stevens. We're going to see it in the future as well. Going back to where we were in Daniel 12. This is what it says, verse 1. The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of peace. Is that what it says? Okay, sometimes I read wrong, so you read right. Okay, don't just take the word of the preacher. You need to be in the word. It says, a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. So here, the prophecy of Daniel is, telling, is taking us to the very end of human history. A time when Jesus once again will be standing up. Meaning that provision for humanity has come to an end. What happened when Jesus went back to heaven after his resurrection? Let's see what happened. Let's, let's, let's go to the book of Romans. Chapter 8. So we're going to be using our Bibles a lot this morning. That way I might keep you awake. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now... No, Hebrew, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm in the wrong book. Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, Now are the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heaven. So when Jesus went back to heaven, what was Jesus doing? He was sitting to the right hand of the Father in heaven. Let's read one more verse. Same book, chapter 10. Hebrews 10, 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So when Jesus is standing up, what is the meaning of it? There is no more provision. We see that Jesus is sitting down to the right hand of the Father. What is the meaning of that? Okay, with that in mind, let's go to another book of the Bible, Malachi. It's the last book in the Old Testament, just before the book of Matthew. Chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. But who may abide the day of his coming? It's a question. Who, and look, and listen, who shall stand when, when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So Jesus standing up, no more provision. Jesus sitting down, what is he doing? He's a refiner. He's purging, he's cleansing his people. And right now in heaven, what is Jesus doing? He's sitting down. So when he's sitting down, he's doing a work of cleansing, 
of purification, sanctification, of refining his people. Because a time is coming when he's going to be what? Standing up. And at that time, you and I, we just read it, we need also to stand up. The day when he appears. What is going to happen that day to the people that are not ready? Are they going to be standing up? They're going to be hiding where? In the caves, right? They don't want to see Jesus coming back. So instead of standing up and rejoicing in his coming, they're going to be hiding because they're not ready to meet him. So friends, this is the sum of what Daniel 12 is saying. It is time that you and I benefit from the ministry of Jesus right now in the most holy place. And that ministry is that he wants to refine us. But let me ask you, he wants to refine us as gold and silver. How do you refine gold and silver? Heat. Heat. It's not just about 25 degrees. It's not even 100 degrees. It has to be higher than that, right? So he wants to take us where we are right now and he wants to put us in the furnace and turn the heat up. So whatever is not gold, what is going to happen to it? It's going to be consumed, removed. And the gold will be then refined and purified, ready for the heavenly mansions. Let me ask you, do you have problems and difficulties and trials every now and then? How, how do we react when that is happening to us? Are we praising God for it or we're blaming God for it? If you and I are going through difficult times, could be finances, could be health, could be family, could be friends, even church members. It could be an employee, an employer. It could be whatever. Perhaps a, a week ago I was driving to work and guess what? A deer hit me. He came out of nowhere and he ran my, 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 my car. Twenty. $200 worth of damage. Say, God, thank you for it. I was not laughing though. Not even smiling. Not even smiling. See, friends, nowadays God is placing us in the furnace. He sees in you, He sees in me, gold but we are not a hundred percent gold perhaps we are thirty percent gold or fifty percent who knows what but the only way to get that gold is by removing everything else that is not gold and he's right now in the most holy place doing that work because he wants us to prepare us for heaven. But let's read one more verse regarding the refining process that he's doing right now. Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 4. Verses 3 and 4. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called what? Holy. Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. When the Lord, who? God, shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment 
and by the spirit of what else? Unburnity. So at the end there will be some people left where? In Jerusalem. That means that the shaking took place. And not everybody remained it, right? Just a few people did. But those who are remaining at the end, they will be, be called holy. Because they were put through the process of burning. And the burning removed everything that was not good. So what is the purpose of the plan of salvation? Is to prepare a people to stand up when Michael will be standing up. Let me read it to you. It's a quotation that I want to share with you this morning. Listen to it. This is manuscript, no, volume 1, 228. It says, God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. Is that going on right now? And what are we to do? We are, be, we are to be true to God at this present time. Listen, this is the purpose for which we establish and maintain our publishing houses. What happened to the Review and Herald? Two years ago. Gone. Why? Because they were publishing and selling books that were not preparing the people to stand up. So God said, there's no more use for you. Shut it down. I continue reading. Our schools. What happened to AUC in Massachusetts? Shut down. They were not preparing a generation to stand up and be true to God during this time. They were offering degrees. But they were not preparing a people to be true and loyal to God in the present time. Our hospitals. What happened to the Walla Walla one? They sold it. Went under. See, they were not preparing a people to be true to God at the present time. So if you are not doing that, God said, I don't want that institution. It's not being used by me. It's just professing to have the name of my people, but it's not doing the work that they're supposed to be doing. I don't need it. Shut it down. Get it out of the way. I continue reading. Hygienic restaurants. We don't have any anymore. Not even one in the entire USA. Not even one. If you want to eat a vegetarian meal, you have to go to the New Age restaurants. Amen. Sad to say, friends. I mean, I was flying southwest two weeks ago on my way to Chicago, and they gave me a, a, a vegan diet, peanuts and juice. <laughs> so you have to fly southwest today to, to get a, a vegetarian meal. <laughs> Treatment rooms. We don't have any anymore. Even the clinic that we had in Walla Walla, they sold it also. And food factories. Not even one anymore. You have to go to Battle Creek, to Kellogg's Company, or Worthington in Ohio, or some other place to buy some fake meat. But they are not our institutions anymore. Friends, I, I, I don't know if you see what is happening. The means that God gave us to prepare a people are being shut down. Why? Because they are not doing the work that God wants them to do. The question is, is it going to happen to individuals as well? Yes. If you and I, and I are not willing to be prepared and refined and purged, the time will come when we're going to be shaken out 
And today you have people sitting in the Seventh-day Adventist church on Sabbath that are shaking out of the truth even though they are still coming to church. They are not prepared to be true and loyal to Jesus at the present time. And if we are not prepared to be true and loyal to Jesus now, are we going to do it then? No, because when he stands up, what's happened to the entire world? A time of trouble is coming, such as never was before. You know what Jeremiah said? If you cannot run with the footmen, can you run with the horses? If today we're compromising, if today we're not taking time to be with Jesus every day and be molded and shaped by the Spirit of God in us, and that means that we have to be in the refining fire. And that happens every day in my home. When things don't go my way. When my children cross my will. When they don't obey me. When my wife perhaps says something that I don't like. Or perhaps what she cooked is not to my liking. Can I sit down and say, praise God for what I'm about to eat, honey, thank you for making this wonderful food. Perhaps I don't have to lie, I don't have to say wonderful for making the food. Because <laughs> there are certain things that I don't care much about. But they are good for me. And she loves me. And that she said, no, you need to eat some of it. Even though you don't like it, it's good for you. God says, eat it. Then I need to sit down and pray and praise God and say, thank you, God, for providing what I need, not what I want, what I need for me. See, every day He's placing us in the refining fire. Every single day is doing that work. That's why in Revelation 6, John asks a question at the end of the chapter. Who shall stand when he cometh? There will be only two people then. Some will be standing, some will be running and hiding. And he looked, he was talking about the seals in chapter 6. And he said that everybody was hiding and everybody was, was you know, running from, God, from Jesus' second coming. And he says, God, is, is there anyone at the end that will be standing then? The question is yes. It's found in chapter 7. There will be 144,000 of them that will be standing then. So let me ask you this. Can we sin and stand? No. What happened to Lucifer in heaven when he sinned? He fell, right? Because he had sinned, he fell. That means that you and I need to overcome sin in the present time. To stand when he comes. That's what the book Hosea, let's, let's go there for a moment. Chapter 14. After Ezekiel, then you have 12 small books. Then you have Ezekiel, then Daniel, and after Daniel you have Hosea. 14.1 says, O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by what? By thine iniquity. So when we sin, what happens to us? We fall. We fall. Let's read another one. Chapter 14, verse 9. Who is wise and he shall understand these things, prudent, and he shall know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the just shall walk in them. But the transgressor shall fall their end. 
So we see that if we walk in the way of the Lord, we are not falling. But the transgression, those who continue to sin, they will fall. Did it happen to Lucifer in heaven? Yes, it did. Let me read to you what Lucifer thought then. Reading History of Redemption. says, Satan had proved himself unworthy of a place in heaven. Then Satan pointed to his followers, compri comprising nearly one half of all the angels. So almost 50% of the angels at one point sympathized and followed Satan in heaven. That's a lot of angels, right? Would you say? Millions and millions of them. Look, and explained, these are with me. He was talking to God. See, 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 I have a lot of followers. I have a lot of people that sympathize with me. And they are willing to follow me. Will you spell them? Also, and make such a void in heaven? God, are you, not only me that have fallen, all of them, they are with me. Are you going to spell them from heaven and create a huge void in heaven? I continue reading. Heaven will triumph. For the vacancies made in heaven by the fall of Satan and his angels will be filled by redeemed of the Lord. Amen. See, Satan did not know about plan two. He thought, I had a mate. I have almost the majority with me. That's what people think today. Well, everybody's with me. Everybody's doing it. Everybody agrees with it. That doesn't matter, friends. To, to God, the majority doesn't matter. Is faithfulness. And even though he has almost half of the angels, says, are you going to spell every one of them? God says, yes. But, but you don't know what I have in mind. There will be people that one day will occupy the places that you left. That's you. And I. Let me read to you another statement. God created man for his glory. That after test and trial, the human family might become one with the heavenly family. It was God's purpose to repopulate heaven with the human family. Satan have no idea about plan B. God created this world knowing way ahead of time that Lucifer one day was going to become Satan and holy angels are going to become demons. And then he created the human family saying, I'm going to give them a test, a trial, and if they are faithful to it, the vacancies created by them, they will fill. But what happened to the human family? If it did, that's why. So Jesus came down to earth and he lived a holy life. For 33 and a half years, right? And they died on the cross. Did he fail the test? He did not. And not only he did not fail the test, he was willing to die for us so you and I could have a second chance to retake the test. Are you with me this morning? That means that today, and every day that we're alive, we're here to take 
the test and pass it with flying colors. And he, by the grace of God, we're willing to pass a test. One day, you and I, where will we be? In heaven! And we're going to be taking the place that was left by Lucifer and his fallen angels. Amen. See, the plan of salvation is wonderful, friends. It's deep. It's deep. What was the test for Adam and Eve? This is an easy one. There was only one single tree that they were not allowed to eat from, right? All the other trees they could eat, and Jesus said, eat of them freely, all that you want. But don't eat from that tree. Was that an easy test or a difficult test? Easy. easy. You know, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, they were not hungry. That was clear disobedience. Because sometimes we eat when we're not hungry, but we just like to eat. Right? And we're not hungry, but wow, this, this, is, this is good. Let, let me try a piece of it. And we're eating. Come on, it's not time to eat. We're not even hungry. You, I mean, you, you, you go for the refrigerator. It's 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> And then you hear a voice, open it. There's something there that you like. <laughs> Who is talking to us? <laughs> the serpent is talking to us. But when he talks to us, he talks as, as we are talking. He says, you. Then you said, I'm hungry. See, I, it's, it's, it's a difficult problem. We talk about this in the morning. That I must die. It's him that counts. So when you hear the voice at 10 o'clock in the night, you say, no, a glass of water will do just fine. <laughs> I'm going to bed. So they had a, a, an easy test. Done it from that tree. And eventually, God's purpose and plan was to take that human family that had been faithful to him and says, come, come home, come home, because you're going to take the place of the fallen angels. But then, you know what happened? They failed the test. And the cross has made it possible for us to retake that test. Let me read to you a statement that is going to show us the test. It says, every person, how many people? has been placed on trial. As were Adam and Eve in Eden. As the tree of knowledge was placed in the middle of the garden of Eden, so the Sabbath commandment is placed in the middle of the Decalogue. In regard to the fruit of the tree of knowledge, the restriction was made, ye shall not eat of it, lest ye die. On the Sabbath, God said, ye shall not defile it, but keep it holy. As the tree of knowledge was the test of Adam's obedience, so the fourth commandment is the test that God has given to prove the loyalty of all his people. The experience of Adam is to be a warning to us as long as time shall last. So every person has been, been placed on trial. And what, what is that final test? The Sabbath. The Sabbath. <coughs> Reading to you from uh, the book The Great Controversy. And, and, and this book is, is amazing, friends. That's why the title The Great Controversy. Because this book was meant to create a controversy. And a great one. 
So some people say, wow, that book is a little bit offensive. It's meant to be. It's not meant to make us laugh and, you know. No, no, it's, it's meant to really create a controversy in every person's heart. Am I being faithful and loyal to God? Why not? It says the Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty. For it is the point of truth, especially controverted. So what is the final test? The Sabbath. You might be saying, well, I, I keep the Sabbath. But don't forget the Sabbath is the final test. It doesn't say it is the only test. How about all the areas in my life? Because if I'm compromiser, compromising here and there, eventually I'm going to compromise on the Sabbath as well. It says, when the final test, what test? What is the most important test when you're taking a class? Usually it's about, what, 50% of the grade, perhaps even more? And how, and when, when, when do you prepare for a test? Before the test or after the test? What happens if you prepare after the test? It's too late. Can you prepare at the time of the test? No, that's, that's not allowed. It's not, it's not open book. It's open mind, not open book, if you know what I mean. So you have to prepare before the test. And it's the final one. And if the final one means that there's no other test. That's, that's it. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who who serve him not. When is that final test going to take place? We don't know when, but we know the event, the National Sunday Law. That's the final test. That means that today in the present, you and I need to be preparing to be loyal to Jesus at that moment. And the only way that we're going to be loyal to Jesus then, if, if we are loyal to Jesus every single day now. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, says that it's the last act in the drama. Last. There's another one. That's it. See, friends, the National Sunday Law will wake up every seven-day Adventist in the world. You know, Matthew 25, ten virgins. How many of them slept? All of them. All of them. And that's our condition in the present. Even among us. We are not ready. We are not ready. Don't let us not be full ourselves. We are not ready, friends. And I'm, I'm going to prove it to you in a minute when we go to, to, to have a meal. <laughs> that's a test. Because it's good food, isn't it? And you're hungry, perhaps you didn't have breakfast. Amen. And then you want to eat more than you should. That's a test. That's a test. So it's going to wake up every seven-day Adventist in the world. Sad to say, too late for the large majority of us. You know, you have the conservatives, the liberals, the nominals, the former Adventists, every of us that ever knew the truth as we know it. When they see that National Sunday Law being a reality, they're going to say, hold on, Jesus is about to come. And the prudent and the foolish will wake up. Is it time to prepare? In a crisis, you rebuild 
the character that you had. You don't form character in a crisis. When you're taking a test, you reveal the knowledge that you already had. But if you have, if you have no knowledge here, what happened to the test? You get, a, you get a big F. You failed. See, we know the truth. But many of us have not been sanctified through the obedience to the truth. We have played, entertained, cherished sin in our life. We are not giving that up for whatever reason. We are holding on to some of them. And instead of coming to Jesus into the most holy place where he's sitting down and he's willing to take all of that junk that you and I have and give us his righteousness. What is that righteousness? His holy life that he lived here on planet earth. That very holy and sanctified life, He is more than willing and able to give to all of us. And if we're willing to give up whatever is holding us back, whatever sin is happening in our life, if we're willing to give up our defects of character, He is willing to take all of that right now. Amen. And to give us His righteousness. Imputed and imparted. We're forgiven but also sanctified. Then when the National Sunday Law comes, friends, there will be, we just read it, a clear demarcation, right? Between the foolish virgins and the prudent or wise virgins. Amos 8, 11. I'm not going to read it. We don't have time. But it says that a famine is coming. Right? And it's going to come to all the world. And people are going to be running. Looking for what? For the Word of God. Can you come to my house to study the Bible? Too late. Can, can we pray? Too late. Can I go to the church? Too late. Too late. Ezekiel, or no, no, Ecclesiastes 8, 5 says that that wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. So if we are wise, we are to discern the times that we're in, right? And also to discern that judgment is going on right now. That we cannot play. We cannot continue doing business as usual. Something has to ha happen to us. Jeremiah 8, 7 says, Animals, they know the time. But my people do not know the times. Proverbs 28, 5 says, Evil men understand not judgment. But the wise man does. So people have no idea right now that there's a judgment going on where? In heaven. And even those of us who know that something is going in heaven and it's very important, we don't really care. We'd rather do whatever we think is necessary to do for my own well-being now in the present than prepare for eternity. We have been told that the events connected with the closing of the work we are to know, even though we don't know the times. We don't know the time. And First Peter four seventeen, you know what it says: that judgment begins with us, not Babylon, with us, with us. Testimonies for the volume, volume 9, page 40 and 97 says that there are many that have not heard the testing truth for this time. So they're going to have a little more time than we're going to have. 
Because we have not the testing truth for a long time. But we have not been sanctified by the obedience to the truth. So the loud Christ is not for us, it's for Babylonians. My question this morning as I come to the end is, friends, what are we to do now? Would you help me do some reading? I'm going to give you some verses and I want you to read them aloud. Okay, who wants to read James 4, 7 to 10? Just raise your hand. Then another one, Zephaniah 2, verses 1 to 3. Another one, Joel, chapter 2, verses 15 and 17. Another one, Isaiah 17, 6. So who wants to read James? Please, would you stand up and read it loud? Verses 7 to... James 4, 7 to 10. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Find your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will so lift you up. So, what are we to do in the present time? Submit ourselves to God. It could be diet, it could be fashion, it could be entertainment, it could be the way I talk, the things I see, it could be my conversation, the words or the phrases that I used. It could be the way I treat other people, it could be the way I do transactions with other people, it could be whatever. What do I need to do? I need to submit to God. All of that. And then when I submit to God, what is going to happen to the devil? He's going to run away. That's right. As we submit to God, then He gives us power to resist. Because we don't have power, friends. We're powerless. You might have the desire to do what is right. That's Romans 7. Paul says, I want to do what is right, but guess what? I do the opposite. And the good that I know that I should be doing, I'm not doing it. I'm doing the evil that I don't want to do. Because there's no power in me. We have the knowledge, but we don't have the power. But Jesus has almighty power. And if we connect with Jesus, guess what? That almighty power is our power. And then as I submit to him, I had that almighty power. And when the devil comes, he is going to be defeated. And then he's going to flee. It's true, he's going to come back again. But every time he's going to be defeated. You know what happens at the end of the seventh play, of the sixth play? In early writings. It says the devil is going to come to the people of God at that, at that moment. And he's going to push every button that he had been pushing before. And says, they have overcome. They have overcome. I cannot make them to sin anymore. And he's gonna back down. Says, ah, it's done. It's done. That's the work of God in human flesh. Fallen, sinful human flesh. The devil will be defeated. Let's read another one. Zephaniah 2, 1 to 3. Who wants to read that one? Would you please? Yes, verses 1 to 3. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation, not desire. Before the decree, bring forth before the day pass as the chaff, 
before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Thank you again. What are we there to do, friends? We need to gather. We need to come together. And seek what? The Lord and His righteousness. So when the day of His anger comes, what is going to happen to the people who have been seeking Him and His righteousness? They will be hid. Protected. Protected. Let's read another one. Joel 2, 15 to 17. And if you have it, would you, Albert? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet, Verse 17, mm -hmm. let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Okay, please, uh, would you read verse 32 as well? Verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So what are we to do according to the prophet of God? Once again, we are to sanctify as a people. It says, come together, blow the trumpet. Blow the trumpet. In where? In Zion. As among us, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. By the way, what day is the prophet referring to here? The day of atonement. That was a day of fasting, by the way. And the day that, that the trumpet was sound in the morning, it's time to gather around the tabernacle. Because the high priest is about to go into the most holy you know that day it was considered a Sabbath day doesn't matter what day of the week it was there were seven ceremonial Sabbaths in Israel this is one of them so today we are in the antitypical day of atonement right so what happened if I ran into you at Walmart on Monday could I say happy Sabbath to you I could, because we are in the Sabbath time, friends. I'm not going to say that, but, but, but just, just to give you an example. So it was a day when everything was put aside. Work, study, you name it. The cares and the worries of the world and life were put aside. So the mind and, and the heart and the time was given. So when the Holy the holy and the most holy priest went into the most holy place, the high priest, they could be ready for that work to be done. But many of us are too worried. We're too busy nowadays, friends. We don't have time barely for anything. We're just running from place to place, friends. We need to slow down. We need to come out of the rat race. And seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Every day I need to take time to be with Jesus. Not just in the morning. It would be nice also to do it in the evening. You know, Daniel did it three times a day. And he was a busy man. He was working in the White House then. And he would tell Mr. Trump, I'll be back in half an hour perhaps. I have something to do that is more important than doing business with you. I need to talk to the Supreme Leader. But I'll be back. We need to take time 
because the antitypical day of atonement is a Sabbath day. But it was a day of fasting. You know what fasting is? It's health reform. When people are eating all kinds of food, and it's good, it's delicious, and they're eating a lot of it any time of the day or any time of the night, we are not to do that. We are to have a, simply, a simple diet. Perhaps two meals a day will be better than three meals a day. But the people of God doesn't want that. They, they love to eat. They love to eat. Not only what is not right, even when it's not the time to eat. Not only was it a day of fasting, it was a day when people gathered around the tabernacle. See, they wanted to hear the high priest bells. He has 72 bells and also 72 pomegranates. One pomegranate and one bell. So when he was moving, they could hear that he was alive. That he was really interceding for them. So we, we need to gather and, and, and to hear when, when Jesus moves. And to follow him no matter where he goes. It was a day when the family will gather together. See, you, you see the family even in sanctuary message. You know that day the house was cleaned. The bodies were washed. The clothes was cleaned. So there was a work to be done at home. Before the work of the sanctuary. And we need to do that work at home as we prepare to see our high priest coming to the end of his ministry in the most holy place. Okay, let's read one more. more. Isaiah 17, 6. Isaiah 17, 6. Who wants to read that one? Anybody? Okay. Would you please? Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it, as the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uttermost bough, four or five in the outmost fruitful branches whereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. All right. So how many people are going to be left at the end? It says two or three. Not a lot. A few. A few. So when the shaking is over, and it's not over yet, we have, give, we have been given five events that will take place in the shaking. It says the straight testimony will cause the shaking, right? What else? It says the love of the world will cause the shaking as well. What else? Says the national Sunday law. We're not there yet. Also says that false teachings are going to come in. That's already happening, by the way. And the last one says the death decree. So five things that will cause the shaking. We are in three of them already. Two more. And the shaking will be over. Says that at the end there will not be a lot of left. Just two or three at the upper most bout. Friends, this is serious. It's serious. It's solemn. So let me ask you what happens when Michael? Stands up. That's it. That's it. And you know the Bible tells us what is going to happen to the entire world. It says a time of trouble such as never was before. I, I read to you a statement from right here from the Bible, Isaiah 33. That is going to tell us. What is going to happen then? Isaiah 33, 3 it says, At the noise of the tumult, 
the people fled. At the lifting up of thyself, the nations were scattered. And your spoil shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar as the running to and fro of locusts shall he run upon them. The Lord is exalted for he dwelleth on high. He shall felt Zion with judgment and righteousness. So what is going to happen then? The entire world, every nation, every community will be in turmoil, in chaos, riots, bloodshed. That means that we are to prepare today to be faithful and loyal to Jesus now and he will help us to be faithful and loyal to Jesus then. Perhaps at that point we will see the importance of country living. Not today. Today it makes more sense to be in Los Angeles or Seattle, big city. You have a lot of employment and nice buildings and hospitals and museums and you have Burger Kings in every corner than to be up in the mountains. But the time is coming, friends, when we'll see the importance of following that counsel. Not just country living, how about being debt free? Because I know a lot of people in the country, they are in the country, but they are not debt free. You know what the Bible says? If you own money, you're a slave to the one that you own it to. So if, if you owe money to your family or credit card or whoever, you are not free. Or if you are depending on the government, you are not free. Even though you might be in the country, you are not free. How about health reform? Today we have plenty of places where we can go and see a doctor. It's true, it's expensive, but you can see a doctor. And he's, he's going to give you a, a prescription. You can go to any pharmacy and buy whatever you want to buy. But not then. That means that we need to know about how to take care of the body. How to nourish the body. How to keep it healthy. How to drink the water and do the exercise. The time, a time is coming when even, even if you go to the hospital, you will not be treated. A time is coming when we cannot buy and sell. That has never ever happened in human history. For 6,000 years, people have been buying and selling. A time is coming when the people of God will not be able to. Even if you have money, you will not be able to use it. Friends, the money that we have today is not even real money to begin with. It's fiat money. It's paper money. It has no value. How about when the Constitution has been repudiated, as we have been told? No freedoms. Friends, a time is coming when we need to make sure that Jesus has done his work in us. And he has done it to such a degree that even though we are going through hell, we're going to reflect his lovely character. And the people at that time who are in a crisis like never before, they will see a group of people who are like Jesus. And they will say, they are the people of God. 
We're not going to have churches like this one. That was not, that's not going to be allowed anymore. However, the people will see Jesus in us. Friends, let us stop being double-minded. Being in and out. If God is God, serve Him. Or get into something else. It's time to be faithful and loyal to Jesus. I finish by reading the statement that says, we need to be enlightened in regard to the plan of salvation. There is not one in 100 who understands for himself the Bible truth on this subject that is so necessary to our present and eternal welfare. So no one in a hundred that really understand the plan of salvation. It's time that we get acquainted with it and let Jesus complete and finish